Welcome to the Natasha Helfer Podcast. To help keep this podcast going, please consider donating at natashahelfer.com and share this episode. You can find Natasha on Facebook at Natasha Helfer, LCMFT, CSTS, and at Natasha Helfer MFT on Instagram and TikTok. You can find all her cool resources at natashahelfer.com. The intro and outro music for this episode is by Otter Creek. This podcast was edited by Ashley Pacini. Hello, everybody. I'm Natasha Helfer. I'm a relational and sex therapist. This is my podcast where we try to attack shame and get healthier through education, stories, and relationships. And no better person than to talk to about all of that than Dr. Tina Sellers. She is a licensed sex and gender feminist, a psychotherapist. She's an author, researcher, professor, She's been on quite a bit of media and she's really kind of well known for exposing patriarchy and sexual shame. And boy, am I all about that. So hopefully we're going to have a really good (laughs) discussion today. You've written two books, Tina, right? Sex, God, and the Conservative Church, Erasing Shame from Sexual Intimacy. That book has a lot of really great ideas, I think, specifically written for people who I think still want a relationship with Christianity, still want, you know, a relationship with spirituality and sexuality. So we're going to really definitely talk about that. And then you've recently written a book called Shameless Parenting, Everything You Need to Raise Shame-Free, Confident Kids and Heal Your Shame Too in the the process. So super excited to talk to you about this topic. You're currently doing quite a bit of work because you founded the Northwest Institute on Intimacy, which is a postgraduate institute to train professionals in sexual health. So welcome to the program, Tina. So nice to have you. Thank you so much, Natasha. I'm so glad to be here with you. Yeah, it's exciting. So as much as you're comfortable, I'd love to start with just kind of your own personal story. I mean, you share a little bit of this in your book, kind of maybe talk a little bit about like where you come from, like your kind of upbringing, maybe in Mm -hmm. religious circles and, and how you're sexuality and religion kind of intermingled in that space and how that informed you. And then I'd love to talk about how that came into quite a bit of juxtaposition with realizing not everybody grew up in that kind of same space you did. So do you want to start there? Sure. Yeah. I think I have a a particularly interesting story because it has lots of different, uh, I think, significant facets. So my childhood, I was born into an, a Swedish immigrant home. And so my grandparents were Swedish immigrants. I heard Swedish all the time. I had several relatives that lived in a great big circle, like around like a few acres. And I spent every other weekend running from house to house to house into great aunts and grandparents and stuff. And totally unable to appreciate that I was growing up in what we would now call a sex positive home. It was for multi-generations, it had been a place where bodies are bodies, everyone has one, bodies are good, and here is how you learn about sexuality. In other words, as I expressed whatever curiosities I expressed, somebody was there to explain that to me, you know, and say, oh yeah, that's your vulva, it's a wonderful part of your body, blah, 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 blah. I mean, just in little sound bites all the way along, and it wasn't just my mother, it was my mother, my father, all my grandparents, and my great aunts and uncles, and so I thought every family was like that. I really did. So it was way later in my life as I was listening to more stories from from clients and students that I realized, oh, I grew up in a really weird home. Like that was not common. And then in the middle of my adolescence, so my family was relatively non-religious. I had two great aunts that um, had a deep, deep Christian faith that when I was much older and thought to ask questions of my aunts, they were like, well, we kind of think of the strain of Christianity as the original church of Acts that grew out. And we don't believe in buildings. We don't believe in pastors in the same kind of way. You know, we have dyadic teams of men and women that travel from home to home for every two years. And and so I actually learned about quote unquote structure of it way later. But these were people that just had a deep, loving presence about them. In my middle adolescence, we moved to Southern California for my junior high and high school years. And this was the middle of the Jesus movement in Southern California. And so it was 
kind of sex, drugs, and rock and roll in the wider culture. It was sort of sex, drugs, and rock and roll inside the Jesus church, the Jesus community, because if they had rock concerts happening all the time, you always went to one on the weekend, right? And if you had a testimony of like, oh my gosh, I need to come off drugs, or I just came off drugs, people just like held you up like, oh, isn't God good? Like, look at you, you're just so loved. So it was, was very non-judgmental. It was very non-legalistic. It was very accepting. And it was very much about sort of love and justice and all that. And so I kind of fell in love with that version of Jesus when I was like 15. And I'm like, oh yeah, like I can get all behind a rebel like that. Like, yeah, that's that's my person, you know? And so that was my version of Christianity through my teens and into my twenties. I just had this sort of like, you know, it, it had, you know, it was about love and justice and blah, blah. This is, this is who the God of the universe was. In 1980, there was a beginning of a very big shift that we are still in that turned very conservative and very legalistic, both sociopolitically, but religiously too, and across the United States. And as I watched that happen, I kind of held on to my own quiet faith and just said, yeah, I don't relate to that at all. Like that doesn't feel like the Jesus I know. That doesn't feel like the God I believe in. So you guys go, whatever, do your thing, but I'm going to be over here disagreeing with all of it as you do it. And, <laughs> and so I've sort of felt a little bit like an anomaly. Like I've taught in Christian schools, high schools, colleges, grad schools, um, where it was, uh, the, where the university had a religious foundation, but not, there was not a requirement for students to. As time went on, I began to feel more and more like a rebel, simply because I didn't move from where I was, what I originally believed in, and what I experienced from my family growing up. And, um, and I, I think I continue to feel like I move, I stay still and the, wherever the culture is going religiously feels further and further away from me. So yeah, that's, that was sort of my, my orientation to it. So I feel like I'm in this weird place where I, I've straddled the world of medicine, marriage and family therapy, sex therapy, done a ton of work in the church spaces and talking and whatever from my perspective. And so I, I can navigate in these worlds with a lot of love and comfort, but also with some very clear critiques about what feels kind and loving and helpful to people and what does not. So. Yeah. Yeah. So I think at least in your book and in, in other times that I've heard you speak, it seems like the first time that you really started honing in on like the purity movement and, and how harmful some of these teachings could be was with your own students, like, yes. and, and starting to recognize that here were people that were maybe younger than you, you would have maybe expected to be more progressive or kind of like, more, you know, we think that the younger generations are going to be like even more, you know, like <laughs> more woke or more, you know, bet, better off than we were right. In some yeah, ways right. or another. And yet here were a lot of your younger professionals that were coming from backgrounds, Christian backgrounds in particular, that were very strict and very rigid and, and very oppressive in regards to their own sexuality and, and how that would correlate with things that you were trying to teach them in these programs and how to work with other people. So do you wanna talk a little bit about that? Like what, how did you start getting interested in noticing this, this trend? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So our program, the program that I taught in um, was a graduate marriage and family therapy program and it had a state requirement that one, at least one sexuality course be taught to those marriage and family therapists. And so I started teaching that course in 1992, taught it all the way through 2019. And one of the assignments that I had my students do was write their sexual autobiography. Now, when people hear that, they think, oh my gosh, I can't imagine ever committing my story to paper. But you know, when you're training up therapists, most of us in the field have a strong belief that you're only ever as good a therapist as you know what your own stories are and that you've done some of your own work, right? Well, sexuality in particular in the United States, we haven't, we had some pseudo comprehensive sex education prior to 1980. It started in the early forties and it was very heteronormative and all of that, but it actually was 
progressive by the standards we've had since 1980. That all, all of the research got pulled on doing sex research in the in 1980 and stay, pretty much stayed that way, as well as the sex education that we did have got pulled. And what we inputted was abstinence education. And so I'm reading these sexual autobiographies, you know, 35 a year. And around the year 2000, there became this marked shift in the tone of these stories, like how the students perceived themselves as they described what they experienced. So what they were describing that they experienced when they had crushes, who they had crushes on, what they thought, what they felt, what they did, what they didn't do, all of that was not that much different than what I had been reading before. But what was different was two things. One was a lack of awareness, reflection on themselves, that what they were thinking, feeling, wanting to do, doing was normative. So they just didn't, didn't seem to know that. And two, partially because of that, and then partially because of the sort of sex is dangerous message that they had been getting, they saw themselves as perverted. And so they would describe themselves in really dark terminology, like they were humiliated by themselves, they were disgusted by themselves, they, you know, and, and this was woven throughout their stories. And I was reading it and it was just breaking my heart. I couldn't figure out like what's happened culturally that pretty starkly I've got students describing themselves in such dark and hateful terminology, their stories that are very normative stories, you know, and sort of in the scheme of things that people are going to experience, by and large, they were falling in that place. And I couldn't figure it out. And it actually took me a couple of years of a lot of digging and, and sitting down with students and talking with them to figure out, oh, these were the students that grew up inside these discourses of sex is dangerous, don't do it, it's going to kill you, or it's going to ruin your future, or whatever. And then for those students that had been involved in conservative church spaces, they then would tell me about experiences they had in their youth groups where these kinds of messages were somatized, if you will. Like they would say, you know, a youth pastor would be talking about how dangerous sex was while he was passing around a lollipop and saying, go ahead and take a bite of this. And then it'd come back and there'd be a stick. This is what you'll be giving to your future partner. This is what you give to God. And it could be a rose with petals or a flower with petals or a piece of pizza or crumbling up foil and then asking them to undo it. You know, just so many stories. And, and they were telling me, you know, yeah, I was 10, 11, 12, 13 was I was doing this. And, and I was thinking, because I did a lot of study and development. It was like, oh my, you were, that was traumatizing for you. Your beautiful blooming sexuality, which had been blooming since you were one, you know, has now been being shut down and told that you are dangerous and that you are corrupt and whatever. So it was uh, manifesting in some of these students' lives, just like if they had experienced childhood sexual abuse. They believed they were bad to the bone, they were damaged to goods, that it was their fault that they had, you know, that they had been intentional in corrupting themselves and others. And yet none of that was at all true. So um, yeah, it was heartbreaking. And I became, because of my background and being sexuality, being so normalized and relationships and doing relationships well and taking care of yourself well, like these kinds of things were normal for me. I just, I just thought that they were being robbed of one of the most precious parts of how we are in the world as humans we're bodied and we love with our bodies you know like we hug and we say hi and you know like and I just thought ah oh, that all of their beautiful liberation and and joy and expression has been robbed from them and and so it really caused my career to take a, a hard shift to look at this, to study it more, understand it more, to get whatever credentials I needed, because I wanted to come out and say, whether you, you know, church, whether you mean to or not, you are causing conditions of sexual abuse on these people's lives. And we have to stop this now, you know, and, and so that, 
So I had been working a lot in medicine and oncology and doing a whole lot of stuff and speaking around that. And I really started to focus almost exclusively here. Wow. Yeah. That's, that mirrors so much of my, you know, my experience growing up in my faith tradition and being a therapist and seeing many of the same concerns of, you know, how are people responding to some of these messages, me included. (laughs) So, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these things and and what you were mentioning with the rose petals and the lollipops, you know, I, I, we call those object lessons, right? Sexual object Mm. lessons. And I remember going to an ASECT meeting not too long ago where they were talking about religion and sexuality. And so the uh, lady who happened to be a pastor who was presenting, she asked about, you know, object lessons. And I was sitting with a bunch of my Mormon LDS colleagues and we were like, oh, oh, it's us. We're (laughs) we're the ones that are going to tell you all of the object lessons. And it was shocking because the whole room raised their hand. And it was a variety, right, of religious backgrounds. And everybody had the most insane, you couldn't come up with this stuff on your own if you tried, like these object lessons that people came up with, like marbles on the floor or, you know, brownies with poop in them or like, it was just like, it was all kinds of stuff, right, that (laughs) were being compared to, you know, yourself and your sexual exploration and development and wow it was like I was like oh okay so we're not the only ones that are messed up (laughs) no no I've had people come up to me at at conferences when I've been talking about this stuff too and and say I didn't grow up in a religious home but I grew up in Texas or I grew up in some other bible belt you know state I got all of this and and I'm like and and it's because we had a merging of church and state we started passing laws to put religious education under other guises abstinence education into our public schools and so of course you got this and and you weren't even told what it was you were getting yeah you know well and you're not being facetious when you say you know that we were taught that it would kill you because there's a sexual education video that I actually use in my trainings where the lady is just like and it will kill you that I mean that she just yeah. that. <laughs> these are these are the things that we were taught in the 80s and 90s and this of course dates to you know obviously there was the sexual revolution in the 70s and then we had the HIV AIDS crisis you know that was so fear-ridden and and the backlash you know I think of both of those things really clamped things down but you also you know you and your book go into much deeper history you know which is the the history of Christianity as a whole and And it's quite complex and I'm not saying we should go into that a whole lot, but do you want to hit on maybe some of the maybe basic ideas as to, because I think, I think this is something people struggle with, right? It's kind of like, well, this is what God says. This is what, this is what God means to be right. But it's, it's hard to, when you grow up in a religious culture to, you know, you're, you're, you're swimming in that, in that water, in that ocean of your religion and your faith, and you trust your God and you trust your leaders. It's hard to step back and go, oh, all of this is happening in a sociocultural space yeah. as well. Right. And so yes. that's a very yeah. difficult thing to, to do. Yeah. And yet we know through history and through the studies of social science and everything that obviously politics and societies have had a lot of influence on religions and religious evolution. And so I don't know, I, I just wondered if you wanted to hit on maybe a few, a few thoughts, yeah. from, like your historical research. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I think one of the things you're speaking to is, is for people where their faith is really important to them, trying to get clear about what is a core value of my faith, a core belief of my faith? And what are doctrines or ideas or rules that got put into place at different times in history that may have had sort of man-made motivation, right? But because what we hear in churches is God says, God says, God says, as opposed to, oh, by the way, in the seventh century or the fourth century, this person decided this. We don't hear that, which is the truth. You know, we hear God said, God says. And so we get confused by, well, what and 
and who is this God that I believe in and what is their core nature? Like, what do I believe about their core nature in relationship to me? And what are the different doctrines that are a part of my faith? And what are the stories behind those, you know? And the story of the sexual ethic in the United States that it falls under the guise of a, a Christian sexual ethic was an ethic that was decided on, if you will, or made part of the empire religion when Christianity became an empire religion, which was the fourth century. And Constantine, who was the bishop, I mean, was the emperor at the time, he had the power to then begin to appoint the leaders of this new church. Now, the church had been around for, you know, a few centuries, but there was no um, person with that kind of power that could establish the institution of the religion. And so Constantine, who was the emperor then had the power and he then started appointing bishops of this new church. At that time in history, the way that the men, because they're of course were all men pretty much, were vying for power, were vying for pick me, pick me, you know, I wanna be the one, was through the denial of the body and the denial of pleasure. And so that's how they were competing at the time to show who was more spiritual than another. Now, when they couldn't deny the body, whether it was, you know, with food or comforts or sexuality or whatever, they just blamed women because, of course, it was always the temptress's fault, right? <laughs> So this grew out of the mind-body split, which would had already been in place since the philosophers, you know, three centuries before Jesus, where there was this belief that the body was beautiful, but it was, it was temporal, right? It was only going to last so long, but ideas, the mind, that was eternal. And so that was the mind-body split that was in place with the philosophers. As we see Christianity growing, they took that mind body split that had been very well entrenched for, you know, several hundred years, and then said, the spirit is what will draw you close to God, the body will take you away from God. And they sort of cemented that. At, and that became the sexual ethic. It didn't have anything to do with Jesus. It didn't have anything to do with being a Jew, what the, what the Jews believed. It didn't have anything to do with, I don't know, just what, what were the core values that Jesus put out in his ministry and you know, all those whatever years before, but it became the sexual ethic. And so it was don't have sex. Eventually, you know, a few centuries later, the men actually grabbed onto celibacy completely, left their wives destitute and their children destitute and then started settling more and more laws around marriage and premarital sex I mean all of it people stand at the pulpit and they say God said but the thing is that's not it's not what God said from what we can tell it is what developed in the course of developing the church we see some of that still go on today where we see in the united states we seem pretty vested in keeping people ignorant about sexuality because we can scare them easier if we do that and if we can scare people we can control them right and so we watched that as you said when when aids and reaction to second wave feminism and we had an economic downturn in 1980 there was a lot of work to just make everything about you know, sex being bad, everything's dangerous, but behind the scenes, what was happening was a push in capitalism. We started dropping regulations in banks. We started drop by mid eighties. We dropped the regulations in media, right? So that we could put whatever we want to on media. It was really about growing capitalism, but we, we put in front sociopolitically this idea that we're protecting the people and we're doing family values that's not in fact what was happening so in the same way that we have to be discerning i think around sociopolitical issues i think we have to be discerning around faith development or religious development institutional religious development and understand what ideas came when and how do those relate to the core values that i have here that's some of the history that I think is important to know is where that where that sexual ethic got started because we see it even in our secular culture now right if a girl is raped or assaulted on a college campus or 
out one night, we immediately are like, well, what were you wearing? Were you drinking? You know, we immediately put it on her um, or on the victim. And that is 2000 years old that we've been doing that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and this this task that you're saying, this this idea that boy, you know, there's there's this responsibility, kind of like a personal ethical responsibility to to look at wherever my faith community, you know, stands in this developmental space. Mm-hmm. That's very challenging, especially if you come from high demand or conservative religions where you're actually told yes. that you're not supposed to do that. That that's, yeah. that's you know going against your faith or going, you know, that you're being kind of like heatheness or being an apostate, right? If you're questioning or not following yeah. the standards or the precepts of your leaders, right? That, that have the right. right or the authority to speak for God or, uh, you know, yeah, for God for, you know, in, in behalf of you. you. So this gets very tricky. It, you know, I think it's easier in some of the religions where it's, it's less conservative or more moderate, more progressive. Um, I think of the Unitarian Church, for example, or um, I mean, they're very open to lots of different ideas. They've developed their own sexual curriculum, which is fabulous. You know, yeah. so it's like, um, yeah, <laughs> there's, there's, so there's, a, there's a big spectrum in religious mm-hmm. experience too, right? So yes, that's exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, and like you say, in some places, questions, just like in some families, are really honored. Like, yeah. Your God is big enough for you to ask questions, ask questions. And then in other spaces, it's, oh, absolutely not, you know? And, and I think people are in those spaces feel really caught, you know, especially if following something actually seems to be causing pain to them or their family or their children or whatever. It's, it, it, you know, their pain goes way up, you know, because they feel caught you know, and especially if it's like, I'm caught between me and God, or however they describe the divine, you know, that is, is awful. But, but that's because in those spaces, the conserve in those conservative spaces, they are speaking for God. right? Right. And so that's where it gets really confusing for the people that are so earnest and faithful, but then something isn't sitting right in their in their body, in their gut. Right. Yeah. You mentioned several things um, in your book that I thought were spot on to my experience. So common themes that kind of exacerbate shame. One was silence around sex in the family home. Mm-hmm. Had this message that sex and marriage are very tightly correlated in a very rigid way. Desire is lust. So non-sexual mm-hmm. love is ideal. Kind of, a, and I, so you're kind of divorcing a passion from romance Mm -hmm. and then this focus on sexual purity, you know, virginity. So those were kind Mm -hmm. of like four different things that I think, Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. I mean, I probably could have added 10 more just because I like do this all the time, but I thought, yes, those are really (laughs) important Mm -hmm. (laughs) kind of like shameful, very common things that are happening in these types of homes and upbringings um, in religious communities. Do you want to expound mm-hmm. on any of those? Yeah, sure. Is there a particular one that you want me to talk about first? Because I could certainly talk about any of them. Well, I think you know, silence around sex in the family home is a huge one. And of yeah. course, that's I mean, and I know you wrote a whole book about parenting, right? So I mean, that's that's another direction we could have gone in this interview, which we're not mm-hmm. really focusing on a whole lot, but. It is. I mean, it's right from the beginning, right? It's not just our churches that give us a message, but what, what's the message that you're getting at home? And even when you're talking about your upbringing, you didn't even know whether your people were religious or not, but you knew you could ask questions. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think a lot of us don't even remember the first time we were shut yeah. down because I think a yes. lot of us are shut down during potty training or when the first yeah. time we put our hands down in our vulva yes. penis areas, you know, yeah. And we're probably like told stop that or and we're probably like right. two or three when those things are oh, happening you know, yeah I don't remember yeah yeah in, in fact I've come to believe that I mean I, I like most people love the work of Brene Brown I think she's helped us understand shame so well um, but I have come to believe that for Americans for the vast majority of Americans like I would say I ask all the time did you go home grow up in a home that was open you could talk about sexuality you talked about it you can remember all the way through or where it was mostly silent or mostly silent and shaming and I'd say 90 to 95 percent of people say my home was silent or silent and shaming at best I got one very painful too late talk 
<laughs> you know? So I have come to believe that for most Americans anyway, that their primary shame and earliest shame has been sexual shame. And it's because of just what you're hinting at here, the development, you know, children at around 10 months old start to realize that they can use their hands to grab things, you know, like, oh, I can reach for that, right? It is, it is a hop, skip and a jump after that, like a month or two, and they're getting their diapers changed or they're in the tub and they discover their penis or their vulva with all these phenomenal nerve endings, right? And we are wired for connection and pleasure as humans. We just, that's what, some of the things we like the best. And, and so, but they're not, the child is not going to be at a place where they can cognitively remember if I do this, if I do X, I'm going to get in trouble until they're between four and five. And then they're going to start to start to put two and two together. And a lot, that's why I think a lot of people will tell you they remember getting in trouble for paying doctor when they were about five, that one stuck, but it happened hundreds and hundreds of times before that, because that's just what they did. That was their natural response to their body. Every time they were found to be doing that, touching themselves, whatever, somebody was likely there to slap their hand away, yell at them, be angry, someone that they desperately loved, somebody who was a mere reflection of their value, right? And so pre-verbally, the vast majority of people have a deep-seated belief that they are not enough, that they are damaged in some way, because it just started so young, right? And then it gets layers put on it that people can begin to remember. Like, oh, I remember getting in trouble for this, or I can remember, you know, whatever. And they've got their stories, which was part of why I wanted people to write their narrative is because I knew that most people's narrative was not a narrative. It was a set of a handful of experiences that they could remember. So if I guided them through questions, maybe they could reflect in such a way that it became an arced narrative so that they could look at it and say, how do I feel about this? Do I want to pass this down? You know, whatever. So I, I think that sexual shame is really at the core of of, of a lot of people's pain and that pain, I can talk about this more later, but their pain manifests in their most intimate attachments. So to intimate others, to children, um, their ability to give and receive love. So having worked in oncology for more than a decade, I have come to believe that what people care about most at the end of their life is how well did I do my relationships? How well did I give and receive love? You know, And sexual shame attacks you at that place. It makes you feel like if anybody really knew me, they couldn't possibly love me. So I'm going to put on a mask and I'm going to show you what I think you're going to want to see. But then when you love that, I'm not going to believe you really love me because that isn't all of who I am. I'm so much worse, right? Which is the under, right? Underlying message. So I don't know if that gets at what you're part of what you're talking about, but I think that silence, it's the combination of the the shame that parents and grandparents bring from their generations, right? Reacting to, on top of the fact that we continue to perpetuate not teaching the things we didn't learn. So we don't learn them. And then we also don't teach them, right? And so we don't give kids that sense of, which I felt so grateful to have gotten was you have a body. Your body is great. All parts of your body are great. Your vulva is not any different than your nose or your ears or your eyes. It's another wonderful part of you that you're going to take care of. And here are ways to do that. And then you get sort of, you know, more complex messages on top of that about consent and what being a good friend is. And, you know, all, all of it that gets added to it gets naturally added. But we have withdrawn that for generations yeah. in our country. And we leave people really ill-equipped to build the life that their heart most wants to build, I think. Right. Well, and I think a lot of times too, silence or being quiet or being reverent, these are all kind of themes that go along with kind of religious orthodoxy. And, and I know in my faith tradition, a lot of times it's like, well, it's not that it's 
it's not that it's secret, it's that it's sacred. And I'm like, oh, well, the problem is, is that, when, that again, young developing people don't really understand the difference. If it's like silent, it's taboo. And it means yeah. it's not okay to talk about. And it means that something is, ang there's anxiety around it, right? And so yeah, right. Kids are, not, kids are not really developed enough to know, oh, well, we're only not talking about this, I guess, because it's sacred. And what does that mean anyway? <laughs> Right, and because there's an inside idea in there that if we don't talk about what's sacred, then to talk about what's sacred is to somehow make it not sacred. Right. Wow, what a powerful thing to say about this body that was created beyond you and this desire for connection and pleasure that is created beyond you. Now, all of a sudden, we've put that into the non-sacred category when maybe I would propose that it could be some of the most sacred parts of being human. Right. You know, I, I yeah. yeah, we don't ask those questions. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. So, okay. So let's, let's, let's start moving into, I mean, there's all these messages, obviously <laughs> that people get, yeah. there's tons of them. We could go down a list of, of tons and tons of okay. messages that people get that kind of disconnect yeah. them from their, from their bodies from their trust of self, right? This whole natural yeah. man is an enemy to God, right? So, oh my gosh, if I have a feeling or a thought or a desire, that must mean I'm an enemy now to God, especially if it has oh. to do with sex. Mm. I never got the message that like my my desires to cheat on my ACT exam were like a natural enemy to God, but somehow my <laughs> masturbation messages did get that message. <laughs> oh, oh it's so sad to me. I did not cheat on my ACT exam, I'm just saying. <laughs> But anyway, so, uh, but yeah, so we kind of get disconnected from our bodies, from our, from our, our self-trust, from our pleasure, from, you know, our ability to connect to others, kind of like you've been alluding to. So, so let's yeah. dive in, like, what, what are the effects of sexual shame? What, what does this yes. do to us? What right. happens? Yes, exactly. Well, and that is, and you might know this already, but that is, that is such an important question. And I, I what my book had just gotten published by two months when a student that I had been on their dissertation committee published our first operational definition of sexual shame, which is yeah. amazing. That was 2017. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, we had no operational definition of sexual shame at all. And, and I, I, I only, because of this, wish that I had delayed my publication if I knew that, I mean, because I didn't even have it in my hand. I didn't even have the dissertation in my hand until after it was published, but I remember reading it and reading the definition that came out of her research and out of her interviews, thinking, this is, this is everything I've been seeing. And, and, and I, I know for other therapists that work in this space, it's what they've been seeing too. But there was something about seeing it in black and white that helped me appreciate how far reaching and profound the effect of sexual shame is on a person's life and on their ability to do intimacy, connection, pleasure, love, giving love, receiving love. So I'm going to actually read you the definition so that I get it all out there for you and for your listeners. I love it. Sexual shame is a visceral feeling. So in your body, not just here, a visceral feeling of humiliation and disgust toward one's own body and identity as a sexual being and a belief of being abnormal, inferior, and unworthy. This feeling can be internalized, so it could go inside, but it also manifests, and this is actually where it begins, it manifests in interpersonal relationships. So beginning, like I said, when they're just a little person, that's the first, it starts to happen between them and an other that they love, right? An interpersonal relationship having a negative impact on trust, communication, and physical and emotional intimacy. So I don't know how you hurt somebody more than to hurt them with sexual shame, honestly. Mm -hmm. Sexual shame develops across the lifespan in interactions with interpersonal relationships, but then goes on One's culture and society plays into that, which is huge in the United States. And then a subsequent critical self-appraisal gets going inside of you. So the inner critic gets going. And then 
That thing we believe about ourselves, we then see it. We see it there, we see it there, we see it there, we see it throughout the day, and it just reinforces this feedback loop, right? Then it goes on to say there is, a, there is also a fear and uncertainty related to one's power or right to make decisions, including safety decisions related to sexual encounters, along with an internalized judgment toward one's own sexual desire. So I know you know the work of Peggy Ornstein, but in her book, Girls in Sex, she talks about a study where these girls felt competent in every area of their life, school, work, desire, blah, 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 until they got ready to go out. And then they were putting down three, four, and five shots of hard liquor because they didn't know if they could keep themselves safe or if they had the right to, right? So this is the rape culture. She did not interview people from religious backgrounds. I think maybe three out of 80, you know, but it came out. And this was the same in Noel, in Noel, Dr. Noel Clark's dissertation work. She had just a few people from religious backgrounds, but we could see rape culture leaping off the page when we look at this definition of sexual shame, that it is, you don't have to grow up in a religious home to get this hook, line, and sinker in our culture right now, since 1980 in particular, you know? Right. So that's, uh, that's it. No, it's profound. It's, I mean, my new tagline is sexual shame is a public health crisis. And yes. I'm not, I'm not kidding around. I mean, people might yeah. be like, oh, ha ha. I'm like, no, Mm -mm. this affects mm -mm. your mental health. This affects your sexual health. This affects your relational health. This affects yes. your you know, parenting, you know, your parenting, your, your levels of depression, anxiety, suicidality, yeah. your mm -hmm. physical symptoms of health. I mean, it's, it's all encompassing. It's so tender and so pivotal to who we are as yeah. individuals. And so this is no small matter, right? This it's not a small matter. No, I, I've, I've sort of done the same evolution over the last, I don't know, five plus years or so. I remember at first talking about this feeling like, you know, everybody's going to like think this is ridiculous. And, and I now don't even feel that. I don't even care. It's like, this is core to how we do what brings us the greatest happiness in our life. You know, how well we do our relationships, how well we give and exchange love with people and live authentically, right? We're hurting people there. It doesn't matter what school you go to, what career you have, whatever. If you're not happy inside with yourself and with others that you trust and you can live authentically, then you're going to be sad towards the end of your life because something's going to, you're going to feel robbed of something critical to your happiness. Yeah. Yeah. Bob, who's listening, says sexual shame is a ginormous part of my lifelong struggle with depression, obesity, and asexuality. And, you know, I remember saying to, you know, getting in trouble. One of the things I got in trouble with, with uh, during my disciplinary council in my church was that I had said that my church was a toxic space for, uh, in particular, LGBTQ plus people, because so much, you know, kind of hate rhetoric and really hate speech, right. That's coming yes, from right. a lot of these religious spaces for yeah. LGBTQ folks. And yeah, they were like, how can you say that our church is a toxic space, you know? And, and when you say sexual abuse, that's, those are terms I had used as well. Those are strong. Those are that's strong language. Yeah. Yet I, I agree with it. <laughs> it is. Well, yeah. Language. We see strong repercussions in people's lives yeah. on a regular. That's right. Yeah. And you know, the only people who can speak to the toxicity of a church around LGBTQ plus queer, queer stuff is somebody who's queer. And if the community of queer folk are saying, it hurts for me to be in your space, whether you want to believe it or not, doesn't matter. That is true. That is true. And they are the experts. They are the one to speak that, right? Yeah, I just, I think that it, it, the... I remember writing a blog years ago on how um, purity movement causes symptoms of sexual assault. So as I was writing it, I thought, I'm going to go see what the Association of Gynecologists and, and Obstetricians, what their definition of sexual assault and symptoms of sexual assault is. 
boom, 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 boom. And so I just put it in the blog post. This isn't my opinion, you know? These are the symptomology you see over and over again. And they're showing up in these spaces with people whose assault can only be attributed to their time getting these messages since they were little because they have, they have no other stories. This is the story. And so it's a complex trauma because it happened over and over and over and over and over again, like, you know, getting a million cuts today. Mm -hmm. And, and that's part of why it's so challenging to heal because it's a complex trauma. Right. Right. Yeah. And a lot of people may not understand, well, how can you be talking about this as sexual assault if nothing physical has happened? But we know, I mean, like, for example, if you show sexual media to a seven-year-old, that's Mm -hmm. Child Protective Services will consider that, you know, mm-hmm. abuse, right? And yeah, uh, right. And if you have like an exhibitionist, you know, like without your consent, show off right. their body, you know, in the park, that's a traumatic experience, mm-hmm. right? So yeah. there's lots of things that can happen that are traumatic and sexual that are not happening Absolutely. to you in a physical way. And when you right. get this message that um, something so integrally normal about yourself is evil or something you can't trust, then yes. you're having this like ongoing like battle with yourself that you can't ever win, then no. you're kind of in a lose-lose situation. Right? right. You have to go to, I am bad. You know, I'm thinking about like, I have a five-year-old granddaughter when she was three or four, you know, sitting on the couch, got a blanket over her and she is just loving up this vulva of hers, you know? And I, I've had so many experiences where I was like, well, what happened to most kids when that was happening? You know, somebody yelled, said, that's dirty, go wash your hands. That's disgusting. Don't do that. I mean, and I would look at her and think to myself, she would be shocked if someone she loved did all of that to her. Like, it would be like, what's, what's wrong with me? Like, she wouldn't be able to make sense of it. So it would go into this place of, I must be bad not what I'm doing but who I am is bad and and this is what we weave into kids from being little until they're you know they're older and they happen to get caught making out with somebody or something you know and it's already been in place long before that you know long before somebody says well you know you do that and God's not going to love you. You're going to ruin your future relationships. You're going to end up getting pregnant. You're going to destroy the family, you know, whatever. Like there's already been the groundwork laid that, yeah, I'm, I'm not to be trusted. I'm an, I'm an F up, you know? Yeah. And, and as you write in your book, and as I've said many times, um, this somehow magically doesn't go away on your wedding night, even if you are both virgins and have kept all the rules. It's not like, oh, voila, now our beautiful sex life begins <laughs> with all this sex positivity that we now go forward with. It's, it doesn't work that way, right? It does we, not work we, that we way. We carry all of this trauma and drama and negativity with us that interferes then with our ability to explore and, um, mm-hmm. and you know, figure out what, what our intimacy life is going to look like. Right, so, right. Yeah. Yeah. So well, I mean, I know you see it too, that, pe- that people wear it in their bodies, right? They've got erectile dysfunction in their twenties. They've got pelvic pain. They don't understand why, why is this not working? Something really must be wrong with me. Well, baby, your whole body was listening. Your whole body was listening. So of course it's going to yeah. take some time. Yeah. 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 It's really a, it's a, it's a healing that we're all having. I don't know even like you said, it's not just this religious kind of message has infiltrated our, our media, our legal system, our culture. So it doesn't mean that you have to grow up religious for all of this to still be part of mm-hmm. the main water that we're all swimming in. So yeah. moving mm-hmm. into what can we do about it? Yeah. You came up with kind of a fun, I don't know, it's kind of like way of, of thinking through this. Mm-hmm. So you, you call mm-hmm. it frame, claim, name, aim. So do you want to- right. Talk yeah. a little bit about kind of your suggestions as far as, okay, here's, here's at least one way to kind of conceptualize the type of healing work that maybe people can start diving yeah. into. Yeah. So it took 11 years for me to write that book. And during that time, I was working with students and working with clients and that kind of thing. And I kept 
working on what is going to help them move through this. You know, it's not something that's going to unravel overnight, but what can I do that will help them continue to move towards a healing liberated space? And so I called it, you know, healing the mess, the model for erasing sexual shame. So frame, name, claim, and aim. And so frame is get yourself a frame or a scaffolding of sex education. So you were taught a lot of things both from culture and maybe from religious spaces that were not true about your body and sexuality and your desires for connection and pleasure and relationships and all kinds of things. And so you deserve to have actual knowledge that you were denied. And so you're going to need to go get that and find that. And so I give people suggestions on try reading this or this or this or listening to these podcasts, whatever, to just start to get that scaffolding. So now you can critically think about what you were taught and not taught against what we know to be true, right? Through science and research and whatnot. So that's frame. Claim is claiming your body as good. It's really hard to grow up in the United States and not have absorbed so many messages about your body not being enough, not being good enough, this enough, that enough, or whatever. We know that 50% of six-year-olds are modifying their diets two thirds of nine year olds, 90% of 15 year olds. So even by the time a little one is six, you know, they're already starting to hear I'm not enough. And especially for girls where their bodies are what is where their value is placed in our culture so often they're getting, yeah, that's not enough. Yeah, that's not enough. That's not enough, right? And so working to start to see our body as good, you know, like I love Adrienne Marie Brown's work, you know, Pleasure Activism or Sonia Renee Taylor's book, Your Body is Not an Apology. Start working on claiming your body is good. You don't want to go to your deathbed and realize you spent 70, 80, 60, whatever years not appreciating the body that you were in that was allowing you to navigate the world and love and do and fulfill your passions and whatever, you know, no matter what shape it is. And I love to say this because I'm a Swede that carries and has forever extra 40 pounds, at least, you know, it's just my heritage, you know, it's, it's, it's the people I come from, but, you know, living in our culture, it, you have to work hard to say, this is a good body today. I got up, I didn't have any pain. I am relatively healthy. I get to write the poetry of my life with my body. I'm going to do it and I'm going to do it out loud and I'm not going to apologize for it. You know, like but that takes, it takes daily work. So that's claim. Name is tell your story to somebody, get together with a group of friends or find a therapist or do a book club with, with the with the sex god and conservative church book whatever but tell your story go around and listen to what it was like to grow up in your family or have people tell their stories of growing up in their family in their environment in their ethnic environment in their church environment in their community environment around sexuality and gender what were the messages that you got and what did you internalize and what effect did that have on you because what you're going to find is you're not alone you're not alone and you've got cheerleaders around you who are going to stand by you as you claim all of your goodness. So that's frame, name, and claim. We have to do that over and over. That's a daily thing that we do. Claim, name, and and, uh, frame. As we do that, though, we are going to aim for a brand new legacy. So we don't pass down the legacy that passed was passed down to us that may have been passed down to our parents and our grandparents. And we can stop it right here. And we can pass down a whole new legacy. And that's part of writing the shameless book. Because I had so many parents say to me, I don't want to do to my kids what was done to me, but I don't know what to do. And I'm like, I got you. I got you. I will give you something that will be like super simple, birth to two, two to four, four to six. Here's what's going to go, you know, so that you can change the legacy. You know, you can do this. It's first about first loving and appreciating yourself and healing from that, recognizing what you were marinated in as a little one, and then begin to learn how to celebrate you, heal your shame, and then celebrate any little person that's in your life, you know? So that's, that's how, that's the process. Now there's many other ways, but those I think are kind of like core beginnings Uh, to do. I think it's a lovely framing. I think it's a lovely framework for sure. And I think, you know, giving yourselves permission, you know, to even get that education or to think about 
um, maybe I deserve a better legacy than this, you know, for some people it even starts there, you know, just yeah. the permission piece to even go down that path. So um, right. yeah, yeah, that's, that's really, really helpful. So a few, a few thoughts I had as I was reading your book. So you definitely come at the book kind of obviously from your own faith perspective, you know, your own ideas about mm -hmm. God and you're obviously very, you know, obviously mm -hmm. your perspective on God is that it's, you know, this must be a loving, involved, caring being. Yeah. Not everybody has that experience with God. <laughs> not not everybody <laughs> with a God like that. Yeah. And of course, there's people who don't believe in God at all, who come from religious sure. backgrounds, who are looking for sexual healing, but that maybe still feel that religious trauma, feel like they were wounded by the religious message, mm -hmm. but maybe are not going to resonate with this thought of, oh, you know, I just need to re rehabilitate my ideas of God and then I'll be okay. Right. So do you have anything you want to say just to kind of people who maybe wouldn't necessarily resonate with your book, but would still resonate with the ideas of healing and religious trauma and maybe spirituality that isn't deity focused or yes. of that nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a, 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 gosh, I don't know, millions probably of people who are in the process of, and we use all kinds of language, but I'll use the language deconstructing their faith. So mm -hmm. really looking at it constructively or critically and deciding what, if anything, they want to take with them as they move forward and what healing is going to look like. And, and I'm somebody who just respects, I respect the process that anybody is going through. If, if for them, they need to kind of throw the baby out with the bathwater, then what does it mean to then support you? What does it mean to have you think of yourself as valuable? What, what do you need that to look like? You know, people are going to come up with their own things. I, I think, so that's, for me is it's really easy to go along that when I'm working with somebody whose God is a punishing God. So they have, they have a God perspective, but that God is, they're not so sure that that God is for them. Right. Then I more want to go into, well, what are the dilemmas that they find themselves feeling? And then how do they want to work with those dilemmas in a way that feels honoring to the God that they have. And I have a lot of questions. Then tell me about your God. Mm -hmm. Tell me about how you came to understand your God that way. What is it about that that makes sense for you, that feels right to you? Any piece of that have questions you have questions about or doesn't feel right to you. I want to understand their perspective, you know, their place, because it's through that lens that I want to think about what can liberation look like for them while honoring the paradigm that they're in right and I also recognize that sometimes some of the questions may act as an intervention in that they never thought oh I couldn't think about this I can think about this what do I think about this like that might be an intervention too and I'm not always intending it to but I do want to open up the space that we learn about our ideas about God or divinity or however we or not we learn about those we we learn about them in our spaces that we're in and so if we learn about them then can we think about that learning yeah. and examine that learning and see does if that learning fit for us at one point does it still fit for us now or are there ways that would feel more honoring to us or more honoring in relationship to how we want to think about you know the transcendent or whatever so it's a it's a matter of wanting to understand them and their perspective and and find out if there's room for us to be curious together mm -hmm. not in any disrespectful way but in a respectful way you yeah. know um and find our way together yeah yeah no I love that I think that's it's a it's a tender spot to know how to navigate you know and mm -hmm. And I think it's it's really important to know how to do that well. Well, let's close up. I know we're we're wrapping up here, but let's close up maybe with this kind of what vision can you give us or ideas? So when people reach this space where maybe they feel like, okay, I've you know healed from sexual shame, which you know I think is an ongoing process. I don't think that you ever reach a, a destination in that. <laughs> but when when they feel more integrated, when they feel like I can tap into my my spirituality, whether that's, you know, based in, in, in a deity or just more in nature, humanity or whatever that, that spirituality is going to be based in. And I've incorporated that with my sexuality. 
what is that what does that interweaving look like what 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 kind of sense can you give us instead of this very divorced you know oh the raunchy and the dirty is over here and the holy and the sacred is over here what right what integration what kind of maybe if even sharing a case study or something where you can kind of show us this is what it can look like yeah well i, I think it comes a little bit out of the organic conversation about what feels sacred what feels when they have experiences that feel deeply meaningful what does that look like for them you know and and then wondering about are there ways that that can incorporate your body your desires for to be seen known loved and accepted which i think is just kind of a core human thing you know and are there ways to weave that together i often will find myself borrowing things from tantra you know the 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 idea of presence you know like so let's talk about times when you had allowed yourself to be present to yourself inside pleasure any kind of pleasure and what was that like how did you allow space to to bring in that pleasure and appreciate that you know and then you know sort of crossing into um have you ever had and this comes from a lot of gina ogden's work have you ever had a time when sexuality felt deeply meaningful to you felt sacred to you felt um important to you or you felt free or liberated in it? and so sort of constructing that together and then and then maybe if it makes sense with for that person depending on how they are in relationship with their sexuality to talk about are they somebody who experiences sexuality with an other? And then what does that look like to bring more presence, more meaning, more space for um, attention, intention, breath, eyes, you know, um, an open heart to a willingness to be seen, you know, that kind of thing. Those are usually places that I go in addition to just helping myself to understand how they think of the sacred like what does that what is that and then then what does that look like if we drew a bridge from that to experiencing it in the context of the pleasure that our bodies can bring us and the connection that our bodies can bring us what what can that look like and so sometimes it's a co-construction which is different for lots of people, it's just not the same, you know? And so you really have to build it from where they are right now and what makes sense to them. You know that as so many sex therapists do that people experience their bodies and sexuality in such diverse ways, so much more than we know given what we see in the media, right? So much more. And so we have to start with where they're at, right? And what is that for them? And I think there's just as much diversity at the, inside the human experience around what the sacred is or what is important to them in a meaningful, deeply meaningful kind of way. And, and sometimes it's in that process of discovering that with somebody that they then begin to think about, oh, what, what would it look like to be more okay with this in me? You know, I love that work so yeah. much. No, so I love fun. it. I love it. Because I do think that that religious sexual shame in particular robs us from something mystical around sexuality, something yeah. that's beautiful in the profanity of it. Like even if yeah. I say fuck me now, there can be I yeah. always, that can be an amazing spiritual thing to say. Yeah, absolutely. We, yeah. And we don't know how to like, it's like, whoa, you can't say that and be spiritual, right? Like that's a naughty word. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so I'm just like, so I'm like, well, you know, I think this is what I'm inviting people to think about is like, yeah. well, sometimes, sometimes in my healing, I need to get rid of some of those words. Like maybe I don't like the word God, or I don't like the word spiritual, or I don't yeah. like the word sacred, like those words. Hey. But sometimes yes. we can reclaim those words, you know, like, like people hey. claim the word queer or slut or you know, pitch or, you know, like we can reclaim those words and say, no, these words now belong to me and I get to redefine them in ways that are now mine. And you know, right. Yeah. Yeah. Something yeah. Kind of really beautiful about that. Right. I remember years ago, I think I was, when I was doing the research for the book, I came across um, uh, learning that 
Plato was the first one to use the word eros in writing. And the definition that Plato used was the coming together in beauty of body and soul. Ooh, I love that. And isn't that beautiful? And, and so I think of the erotic is, according to the Jewish mystics, is that is life energy. Erotic is life energy. It's, it's sort of like the, the, the breath of all of the universe coming in and out of our body, right? And when we have passion and we have desire, that is life energy. That is erotic energy. But I love thinking about it's the coming together in beauty of body and soul. Beauty is different for everybody. That's the word that is going to be different. But, but imagining that it can come together in an experience, in a moment, in a way that works for you and feels bigger than you is kind of fun. I think. I love it. Well, thank you so much for this time that you have spent with me and my audience. It's been just lovely. You have so much knowledge and wisdom to offer in this field. And I know many people who have trained with you and, you know, a lot of my colleagues and stuff. So everybody has wonderful things to say. And anyway, I hope that you've enjoyed this time. I don't know if there's this anything else great. I'm hoping that I would have asked you or anything like that, but otherwise I think this is, this has been awesome. yeah, so fun. So fun to do this with you, Natasha. Thank you so much for asking me. I can have this conversation with you any day. I know, right. We can always talk about science. <laughs> so. <laughs> All right. Totally. Dr. Fullers, thank you again and have a okay. great day your week. Thanks. <laughs> you care. too. Bye. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for listening to this episode of the Natasha Helfer podcast. To help keep this podcast going, please consider donating at natashahelfer.com and share this episode. You can find Natasha on Facebook at Natasha Helfer, LCMFT, CSTS, and at Natasha Helfer MFT on Instagram and TikTok. You can find all her cool resources at natashahelfer.com. The intro and outro music for this episode is by Otter Creek. This podcast was edited by Ashley Pacini. There is a place where time slows to nature's pace and there is space there to find yourself in her embrace some places should be left alone so the homeland of the heart Ten thousand years of our human history etched on Earth's mysteries Some places should be left alone So we can always go To the homeland of the heart To the homeland the home